Welcome to When One Thing Leads to Another, a podcast that takes you freewheeling down the great internet rabbit hole of trivia. Each week we pick a starting point and then who knows where all the twists, turns and tangents will take us. But we'll be sure to unearth a treasure trove of frivolous facts that will be as fascinating as they are, well, useless. When One Thing Leads to Another is produced and presented by us, Helen and Bill Rich. Our theme music is by Justin Mitchell. This is Series 2, Episode 5, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Now, we watched the brilliant film Everything, Everywhere, All at Once the other night, didn't we? We did. And we very (laughs) much enjoyed it. Loved it. If you haven't seen it, Wikipedia describes it as an absurdist comedy drama. Do you think that's a fair description? It's absolutely spot on. Definitely absurdist. And it's very entertaining. Anyway, whilst I was watching it, I kept thinking, where do I know Michelle Yo from, who plays the lead, Evelyn Kwan. And it wasn't until the end I had to give up and Google her, and of course it was from uh, Crouching Dragon Hidden... No, it's the wrong way, isn't it? Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon. That's the one. Yeah, anyway, so I thought I would do a little bit of Googling of Michelle Yo. Well, that's what we do. And lo and behold, blow me down with a very small puff of wind, there's a number of rather interesting facts about her. Jolly good. Let's hear them. First of which is the fact that she was born Yo Chu Keng in Malaysia in 1962. Mm. Uh, And she moved to the UK with her family at the age of 15. And when she was 20 years old, she represented Malaysia in the 1983 Miss World Beauty Pageant. Oh, wow. Did you know that? No, I didn't. And owing to that success, she appeared in a commercial with Jackie Chan. Yeah. Which then courted the interest of the film industry. And then her acting career took off in mostly martial arts films. Right. Um, And at that point, interestingly, she called herself Michelle Kahn. Right. Um, And she married a bloke called Dixon Poon, right? (laughs) Um, Who was and remains a Hong Kong businessman who is chief executive of a company called Dixon Concepts, which probably doesn't mean anything. Um, But they own Harvey Nicks. Oh, right, okay. Dixon Concepts. Yeah. Not Dixon Concepts. That's a totally different shop, I think. Anyway, Michelle Yeoh changed her name from Khan to Yo for her role in the 1997 Bond movie, Tomorrow Never Dies. Oh, that's that's where I know her from. Oh, okay. oh yes, yes. Um, and that she was... was on the back of the motorbike with Pierce Brosnan. Yes, I remember now. Oh, you've seen it. I haven't seen it, so I can't... A long uh, time ago. I can't tell you whether it's any good or not. Actually, I've got some... Interesting information on Pierce Brosnan. May I interject? You you may indeed. Um, he starred in four Bond films. Oh, it was four, was it? Yeah. Um, apparently, he's the only Bond actor who has been allowed to star in other films while under contract. Oh, right, OK. Yeah. One of the conditions, however, was that he couldn't wear a tuxedo in any of the scenes of the other movies. Oh. <laughs> which is fair enough. Which is fair enough. I just love the fact that that would be a clause in the contract. Yeah. He boasts being the lightest and heaviest Bond of all the actors. You are. For Goldeneye, his first Bond film, he weighed in at 164 pounds. That's 11 and a half stone. Okay. Making him the lightest Bond. Okay. And then by his fourth Bond, yeah. Die Another Day, he was 211 pounds, which is just Ooh. over 15 stone. Okay, so he'd been uh, on the old kebabs or something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and just going back to where we started with the film Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, one of the other outstanding actors in it is uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Oh, she's fabulous. She it? is brilliant in that. She's I mean, they're brilliant. all. I mean, they're all brilliant in that. But she, yeah. uh, I really enjoyed her role, uh, her in that. And um, of course, there is much to be learned about Jamie Lee Curtis. Mm. And in fact, when I was googling her, I realised I really didn't know very much about her at all. Yes, well, I recently learned that her dad was Tony Curtis. Oh, you didn't even know that? I had no idea. (laughs) Well, at least I knew that. But what I didn't know was that her mum was Janet Leigh. Uh, Yes. She's Um, uh, from Psycho. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I had no idea. No. And then I kept reading. And then, oh, hang on a minute. She's also married. To Christopher Guest, the uh, who's he again? Yeah, well, he's uh, he's one of the uh, the guys from This Is Spinal Tap. 
Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah and yeah. Uh, Best in Show. And um, so I had no idea of that. And then, you know, these Hollywood types. I also read, um, as a little side dish, if you will, that she's also Jake Gyllenhaal's godmother. Oh, I didn't know that. And if we can just keep going on that tangent, yeah. apparently Jake Gyllenhaal's first driving lesson was with Paul Newman. Oh, right. OK. <laughs> so uh, there you go. That's a star-studded... Uh, circle. Circle, in it? And I thought this was... Very interesting about Jamie Lee Curtis, and may I say rather unexpected. She actually holds a patent because she has invented a nappy. Right. That's a diaper for our American friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think she... And Is Chris it a nappy for babies or adult? No, adults? It's, it's a nappy for babies. Her, She actually adopted kids, right. and supposedly she was so fed up with having to carry around not only nappies mm. um, but also wipes yeah. in separate containers mm. she invented a nappy where there's a built-in pocket mm. uh, where you keep your wipes oh. and it's uh, waterproof although I was thinking it should be called wee proof really I decided to do a little digging on um, this is spinal tap because obviously Christopher Guest is Jamie Lee Curtis's Hubby. Um, you'll remember that the band gets through a lot of drummers in the film. Oh, I do. Know. That's absolutely hilarious. Yeah. yeah. They all die in elaborate ways, don't they? And um, do you remember the one who dies by spontaneous combustion? <laughs> yeah, I think it's right at the end. He's in, he's, he's in his drum kit and he just goes up in a puff of smoke. Yeah. His, he, that was, his character's name was Mick Shrimpton. OK. And he was played by the real-life drummer Rick Parnell... Right. Who played drums on Tony Basil's hit Mickey. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's a nice little tangent. Yeah, and that dragged me down another rabbit hole Okay. where I discovered the song Mickey was actually a cover of a 1979 oh. song by the 70s band Racy, oh. which was called Kitty. Oh, Kitty, what a pity you don't understand You take me by the heart the song was written by songwriting duo Mike Chapman and Nicky Chin, who were prolific songwriters for 70s and 80s bands like The Sweet, Mud and Susie Quattro. So all of that oh, glam yeah. rock. A bit of glam type. rock type thing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in fact, they were incredibly successful in the 70s. And from 1973 to 1974, the pair had 19 hits in the UK Top 40 wow. singles chart. Yeah, including five number ones. Good grief. Yeah, that's impressive, isn't it? Wow, that is some Just, record. To say the least, yeah. yeah. The um, So these songwriters, Mike Chapman and Nicky Chin, they eventually separated. Okay. And Chapman went on to produce Blondie's classic Parallel Lines. You're joking. Yeah. And reading about it here, Chapman was, how shall I put it, a pretty self-assured bloke, okay. let's say. Yes. When Parallel Lines was released to almost universal praise, yeah. Chapman said, there's loads of hits, it's a great album, but who gives a f***? It's easy, you see. When we go into the studio, we go in and make hit records and it just happens. We don't think about it. If you're going to be in the music business, you've got to make hit records. If you can't make hit records, you should f*** off and go chop <laughs> meat somewhere. <laughs> Another interesting thing about Mike Chapman, something that I really found interesting, you'll see why. Go on. Um, he also wrote, along with songwriter Holly Knight, okay. um, the hit single by Tina Turner, The Best. The Best. What? Simply The Best? Well, that's the point. It's not called Simply The Best. It's just called The Best? It's just called The Best. Well, I never knew that. Who did? Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all thought it was called Simply the Best. Apart from really hardcore Tina Turner fans, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Another interesting thing is that Bonnie Tyler originally sang that song a year before Tina. Oh, right. In 1988, but it tanked. Oh, I didn't know that either. No! And um, a final interesting thing. A final nugget of fascination. Mike Chapman and co-writer Holly Knight first offered the song. Yeah. Have a guess. Oh, it's going to be someone... Ra it's going to, my, my default is usually Sinead O'Connor, but I don't think that fits in this one. I'll say Dolly Parton. Paul Young. <laughs> <laughs> Can't quite imagine him singing the best. No. But there you go. There you go. I, yeah, I can definitely imagine Bonnie Tyler singing it. Cool, I bet she belted it out. Yeah. 
Right, talking of uh, Mike Chapman and Nikki Chin, the mm. writers of Mickey, yeah. which was formerly Kitty, and I discovered that they first met when Mike Chapman was working at a London nightclub called Tramp. Okay. And I thought, oh, this probably won't go anywhere. Anyway, as it turns out, I did a little bit of uh, research and there's some quite interesting bits and pieces about the nightclub Tramp. Okay, where is Tramp? Tramp is in uh, Mayfair. Okay. For those who don't know that, that's the posh part of London. Yeah. The owners, uh, Johnny Gold, great name, uh, Billy Offner and Oscar Lerman formed the club in 1969. Right. And what they did was they banned photographers and gossip column journalists in order to create a safe space for celebs. Right. So celebs where they could get up to whatever they want. Exactly, without any risk of uh, being papped, prying eyes. Quite exactly. Um, and this this worked rather well, and it attracted many celebrities. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a policy that if a punter, if a regular punter asked a celebrity for an autograph, they were very briskly shown the door. Right. And. I read here that Michael Caine, Joan Collins, Peter Sellers, Natalie Wood and Richard Harris all attended the opening night. Right. And I also, (laughs) I thought this was funny, that on one occasion apparently George Best and Mickey Rourke had a drinking contest. Wow. Can you imagine? I mean, that must have been epic. However, I could not find out who won (laughs) and how it was decided how that person had won. Well, my money's on Georgie. You'd put your money on George, would you? Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. And apparently Keith Moon was also a member Mm -hmm. of Tramp Nightclub and he once ran up a bar tab of £14,000. Right. Now this would have been, I mean, that's a lot of money now. That would have been in the 60s. In the the late 60s, early Mm. 70s, that was a tonne of Mm. money. Um, And he was also barred for a month after destroying a chandelier in in full-scale Keith Moon rock and roll styley. However, what he did was he sent 500 quid in a chauffeur-driven limousine to the owners and begged for forgiveness. Oh. And so his bar lasted a mere 48 hours. Jumping back to Mike Chapman, if I may. Oh yes, again. the writer of the a co-writer of Simply the Best. The Best. Of course. Um, he also went on to produce for the band The Knack. Yes, and that smash hit, My Sharona, was produced by him. But the album that followed flopped. And Chapman and the band fell out, apparently. Oh, OK. And the Knack's lead singer, Doug Feiger, oh, I. or Feiger, is quoted as saying, Mike Chapman is one of the bigger assholes that you'll ever meet on the planet. He was not a big fan. No. And if I may, a little bit of information on the song My Sharona. Ding, 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 ding. Uh, yes, great song. Used to be on my running playlist. Oh, did it? Yeah. Would it give you a little G up and you'd just... It uh, was a good one. Yeah. Um, it was written by the Nax guitarist Burton Avare and the aforementioned Doug Feiger. Oh, yes. Or Feiger. Um, it, he wrote the lyrics about a girl he came to take a shine to, despite him having a girlfriend at the time. Oh, right. Old Doug Feiger. Feiger. Uh, apparently, the girl, whose full name was Sharona Alperin. Oh, so he, he used her real name? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. She was working in a clothes shop, and Doug asked her to come to a gig that the Knack were playing. All this in front of his then-girlfriend. She must have been fuming. And despite Sharona having a boyfriend herself. Good grief. Yeah. He did eventually get with Sharona Alperin. Oh, did he? And was with her for four years. Wow, OK. So yeah. a bit of uh, persistence paid off there for old Dougie. Yeah, before his rock and rolling and drinking got too much and she left him. Oh, OK. Later saying she needed to become her own Sharona, not someone else's. I imagine that when Sharona, you know, whenever she's introduced to someone and they and she says, oh, I'm Sharona, I bet everybody goes, ding, 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 ding. My Sharona, I bet that really brasses her off. They'd probably say, oh, were you named after the song? And she can say, no, the song was named after me, bitches. Boom. And in America, the name Sharona was very uncommon. I mean, it's an uncommon name. I mean, I've never met a Sharona, have you? No. Anyway, yeah, in the years leading up to the song, there were only about 10 Sharonas born each year in America. Wow. Yeah. And in 1980, though, about 70 American Sharonas entered the world, a spike attributed to the song. Wow, that's still not a lot, is it? 70? No. 
OK, well, following on from your fascinating facts regarding My Sharona mm. by The Knack, do you remember Weird Al Yankovic? Mm -hmm. I do, very well. Yeah, he... Eat it, eat it, yeah. eat it, eat it. That's him. Yeah, he would parody well-known pop songs of the time. Yeah. And he would play a squeeze box. Yeah. Oh, I don't remember the squeeze box. Yeah, he would play polka versions of, oh, of pop songs. Yes. That was sort of his shtick. He's far better known in America than he is here. Yeah. And in fact, I was amazed that when I sort of did some Googling of him, his Wikipedia page is just goes on and on and on and on. It's it's, it's incredible. You're thinking, right. oh, you think, oh, weird Al Yankovic, maybe they get a couple of pages in there. Yeah. Oh, no, man. It took me ages to right. read all of his stuff. But um, he did a version of the Knack's My Sharona. Oh, yeah. And a lot of his songs would be became food-based. Okay. And so he turned My Sharona into My Bologna, which we'd say My Bologna. Oh, my, Bologna. My, my Bologna. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and apparently this was um, while he was at college. He started writing these parodies, and uh, my Bologna was one of them. And he actually went to a show at the college where the Knack were playing, right. managed to get himself backstage, and introduced himself as the man behind the song My Bologna. Okay. And old Doug Feger of mm. the Knack not only liked it, he tipped off the president of his record company, Capital Records, and they agreed to put it out. Oh, good, yeah. old, good so, old Doug. So Doug had a good sense of humour about it, which is, uh, which is rather nice. Yeah, and I also read that uh, Weird Al, he makes a point of asking the singers and bands permission mm -hmm. to um, do a parody of their songs. Right. He likes to keep people sweet. Yeah. Uh, this is despite the fact that he legally isn't obliged to. Yeah. Um, as long as he pays royalties. And in fact, um, Nirvana, he mm. did a, uh, a parody of their Smells Like Teen Spirit. Mm. Um, it was called Smells Like Nirvana. And they actually took that as a sign that they'd finally made it, that they'd finally become successful. Who, Nirvana? Yeah, Nirvana. Right. So they were delighted that uh, they'd caught the attention yeah. of Weird Al Yankovic. Yeah. And uh, Michael Jackson was a big fan. So yeah. he was totally happy with him yeah. to do a version of Beat It yeah. and call it Eat It. And he even uh, lent Weird Al one of his sets for his own videos. Oh, so, great. So yeah. Weird Al could use yeah. one of Jacko's sets. Yeah. And Mark Knopfler oh, of yeah. That There Dire Straits, yeah. he was such a big fan of Al's work. Mm. He actually played lead guitar on the parody Money For Nothing Stroke. Beverly Hillbillies. Brilliant. Actually, did you know Weird Al Yankovic did a parody of Mickey? Oh, well, as oh, in Tony, Tony Basil's Tony Basil. Mickey, yeah. And Weird Al Yankovic's version was called Ricky. <laughs> so it's been Kitty, Mickey and Ricky. Ricky, yeah. Which, if I may, briefly brings me on to Tony Basil. Yeah. I've got some interesting facts about Antonia Christina Basilotta, ah. which is her given name. Great name. It is. She was and still is a dance choreographer and she yes. choreographed David Bowie's Diamond Dogs Tour okay. in 1974 and his 1987 Glass Spider Tour. Okay. And she's choreographed a load of feature films including American Graffiti, right. My Best Friend's Wedding yeah. and Legally Blonde. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. She's also directed some music videos too, okay. including her own video, of course, for Mickey, yeah. which she also choreographed. And she also co-directed the Talking Heads video for Once in a Lifetime. Oh, well, I never knew that. Yeah. You'll remember David Byrne does all those jerky movements. That yes. was That was all choreographed by Tony Basil. Who knew? There you go. That's my Tony Basil interjection. Well, thank you for that. You're very welcome. But I'm going to drag us back to Weird Al Yankovic Please again. Please do. Because I found this was rather interesting, mm -hmm. talking about getting permission for parodying songs. Yeah. Paul McCartney, now he's a self-confessed Weird Al Yankovic fan. Mm -hmm. And Al approached him to do a parody of Live and Let Die. OK. Right? And as I say, Macca is a fan, but he declined. Oh, because as a vegetarian, he didn't like the fact that Al's parody of Live and Let Die was going to be chicken pot pie. Nice. Thank you for listening to When One Thing Leads to Another, a podcast produced and presented by us, Helen and Bill Rich. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please rate and review us on wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe, and that way you'll never miss an episode.
We'd also love to hear from you, especially if we've got any of our information wrong, or you have some more fascinating facts about something we've talked about, or you could even suggest a subject for our starting point. Our email address is when one thing leads to another at gmail.com. A massive thank you to Justin Mitchell for letting us use his music as our theme song. It's a track called Homo Erectus, taken from his fantastical album called The Garden of Earthly Delights, which is available to buy from bandcamp.com. Thanks also to Acast for hosting us. Join us next week for another episode of When One Thing Leads to Another. Please note that all facts have been found on the internet and therefore we cannot vouch for their veracity. Mm -hmm.